hello everyone. Thank you very much for joining us. It's great to see so many attendees here today. I'm Nick Martindale. I head up VWV's in-house lawyers club. I'm just going to do a, a very quick introduction, but having seen how many slides we've got to get through today, I will be keeping it extremely brief. So uh, this is the last webinar in VWV's in-house lawyers program, uh, having previously run webinars and some roundtable events in relation to data protection and commercial property. We'll be putting some thought towards next year's program soon, but I anticipate it will probably run along similar lines. We'll send out details early on next year, so keep an eye out for those. But uh, for the moment, we'll get on with today's webinar. Today's broad topic is employment law, and we're lucky to be joined by two of VWV's eminent employment law partners, Bob Fahey and Alison Cook. Bob will first of all be dealing with the recent Supreme Court case of Brazil and its impact on holiday pay for part-time workers, and Alison will then be dealing with a general employment law update. We'll hopefully then have some time for questions afterwards. Um, without further ado then, I will hand over to you, Bob. Thanks, uh, Nick. Morning, everyone. Um, I'm uh, Bob Fay, partner in the employment team at BWV, as Nick says. Um, and I'm going to be covering the Supreme Court's judgment in the Brazil case this morning. Um, we um, were conscious that we do have some employment lawyers on the call with us, but quite a lot of you um, aren't employment law specialists. And we're also conscious that uh, we're joined by in-house lawyers from the public sector, uh, higher education and a range of different commercial um, companies. So I'm going to keep it relatively high level and talk about key principles rather than trying to get too much into the uh, nitty gritty of holiday pay calculations because uh, it's uh, 10 o'clock in the morning. We want to keep you awake. Um, uh, but if any of you do um, uh, require to go into it in more detail, uh, our colleagues have producing, been producing a series of uh, longer webinars on um, the Brazil judgment, which are available to view again on our website. Um, so you can you can go and look at those, or of course, uh, you can give us a call and, and speak to us about any specific questions you have. So just to uh, set the scene about where current UK holiday pay rights um, come from, um, they are found in the UK Working Time Regulations, which uh, implement and uh, indeed add to, some might say implement imperfectly, <laughs> and add to the EU's Working Time Directive. Um, the basic points to bear in mind is that uh, Regulation 13 and 13a together uh, provide for a total of 5.6 weeks of uh, entitlement to paid annual leave. Um, and the method of calculation of your pay for that annual leave um, is uh, set out in Regulation 16 of the regulations, which says that holiday is to be paid at the rate of a week's normal pay uh, for each week's leave, and that the method of calculating that pay um, is uh, to be found in the relevant parts of the Employment Rights Act that deal with what a week's pay means for different categories of workers. And we'll, we'll go on to the different categories of workers and look at how the Brazil judgment uh, affects each of them. Uh, so that's the basic uh, statutory position. Let's let's move to the next slide, please. Um, now, previously, uh, in particular for casual workers or those with irregular hours, a common method for calculating holiday pay pay has been the percentage method, um, by which we, we mean that um, employers have worked out what proportion of a normal full-time working year um, is represented by the 5.6 weeks of paid leave. And they do back that by taking 52 weeks in a year, uh, subtracting 5.6 weeks from 52, leaving 46.4 weeks, and then working out what proportion of 46.4 weeks is 5.6 weeks paid leave. And um, that gives you the figure that some of you might have seen previously of 12.07%, uh, representing the rate at which holiday pay accrues for each week worked. Um, and that's an approach that was approved um, in guidance from both ACAS and the BEIS. 
Uh, and as I say, it's been relatively common in, in a lot of different sectors where there is irregular working patterns. Uh, another relatively common approach, uh, one that uh, those of you who are joining us from higher education institutions might well uh, recognize for term time only staff, for instance, but one that's used for um, a, a lot of different situations where um, workers work a fixed period of time over a full year, but less than a year is a, is a pro rata principle. Uh, and essentially um, that would involve um, looking at the total amount of working time um, that, that, um, that a worker is engaged in a year and um, looking at what proportion uh, of uh, a, a full uh, working pattern it represents. So this is what happened in, in Mrs. Brazell's case. Uh, she worked in a school, she worked uh, 34 weeks uh, over a full academic year and comparing that with 46.4 weeks, which is the maximum a, a worker can work, um, Mrs. Brazell was working there for the equivalent of 73% of a full-time colleague's working time. So her paid holiday entitlement was calculated as 73%, so the pro rata reflection of her working time in the year of the 5.6 weeks entitlement, and that gave her in the end uh, just over four weeks paid leave. Um, so those are the two relatively common approaches that have previously been adopted. Can we move to the next slide, please? Well, so what does the, um, did the Supreme Court decision say about this? So um, Supreme Court has dealt with Mrs. Brazell's challenge to the method of calculation um, that was applied to her. Um, and it has held that um, regardless of your working pattern, if you work throughout the year, you are entitled to 5.6 weeks paid holiday. And the way you work out the pay for that entitlement is to apply the provisions of the Employment Rights Act um, with no mechanism to prorate to account for working part of the year or working intermittently on a casual or zero hours basis. Um, so next slide, please. What, what are the uh, practical implications of this? Um, the principle is simple. Um, in, workers are entitled to a normal week's pay over 5.6 weeks of paid leave. Um, the difficulties start to arise when looking in practice uh, at the four different categories of staff identified in the calculation provisions um, of the ERA. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll do that now. So if we move on to the next slide, please. Um, so the first category of worker identified in the ERA is anyone who works a fixed number of hours and receives a fixed amount of pay for those hours. Uh, so that would include um, a worker like Mrs. Brazell, who works a part year on a part year basis. Uh, it would include um, full time employees. It would include uh, a part time employee who works a three fifths of a normal week uh, in the same pattern throughout the year and receives the same um, same pay annualized over the course of the year. And, and any of those kinds of workers um, receive are, are entitled to receive a normal week's pay for each. Uh, week of annual leave. Um, so hopefully so far, so straightforward. Um, we go to um, the next slide, just to give you an example of how that might work in practice. Um, so for those who work, uh, let's say a set number of weeks per year, you would add the 5.6 weeks of paid holiday entitlement to the working weeks that they actually work to work out the annual total pay. Um, and then often that would be averaged out um, over a 12 week or monthly installments, as it says on the slide, to get um, an average equal monthly payment. Um, so the example we've given is, let's say you've got a worker who only works 39 weeks out of a total of 52 in a, in a full year, you would have to take those 39 weeks of work, add 5.6 weeks of paid leave and get to a total of 44.6, weeks of paid uh, time, working time. And then if you wish to, um, for practical purposes, you can average out that pay over, over um, a standard 12 month payment. 
Um, there is one uh, potential uh, complicating factor in respect of this kind of worker, um, which is overtime. So if we just move to the next slide, please. Um, the general rule with overtime is that as long as overtime is not part of a worker's normal remuneration, it can be excluded from calculations of holiday pay. Uh, so for instance, if you have a worker who um, on a one-off or uh, unusual basis is called into work over time because a colleague is off sick, um, then you don't have to take their overtime pay into account when calculating their holiday entitlement. There has been um, a, a raft of EU case law dealing with the circumstances in which overtime might be required to be taken into account in respect of holiday pay. Um, and uh, we could we could certainly do a full 40 minutes just talking about um, about overtime and holiday pay, but we won't. Um, the uh, So if it's genuinely ad hoc and unusual, it can be excluded. Um, on the other hand, uh, generally speaking, if um, overtime is part of a, a worker's normal working life, whether because it's expressly set out in the contract or it's part of a normal um, practical working pattern from day to day, then you do have to take what would be called compulsory or regularly worked overtime into account. Um, just to make it even more complicated, um, because this principle derives from EU law, uh, it only applies to the first four weeks of annual leave, which comes from the Working Time Directive. It doesn't come from the extra 1.6 weeks of annual leave that comes from a Regulation 13A of the Working Time Regulation. So you only have to take uh, regular or guaranteed overtime into account um, in respect of four weeks, the first four weeks of statutory leave. Um, so as I say, it's a topic in its own right. Um, uh, for the purpose of today, it's, that's probably all you need to know about um, the need to ask the question um, of your HR colleagues if, if they are talking about um, holiday pay calculations for salaried workers who work occasional overtime. Um, so moving on to the next slide, please. We've got two uh, categories of workers here. Um, given time constraints, and also because I don't think there's likely to be many, if any, of the uh, people on the call whose organizations are engaging peace workers, I'm going to skip over the, the peace work category. But if if um, you do have peace workers who want to talk about it, by all means, we can deal with it in the Q&A. Um, so then we move on to uh, the next category of workers, um, which is where uh, normal working hours with pay that varies according to when the work is done. So classic examples of that would be where you pay workers some kind of enhancement for working weekends, uh, working um, unsociable hours, working nights, or, or other unsociable shift patterns. So they get an enhancement to their pay that varies in accordance with the nature of the timing of the work they do, for instance. Um, and the basic principle here is essentially, you have to calculate an average both of the weekly working hours and an average of the hourly rate of remuneration, and then apply that to determine what a week's a normal week's pay is in that person's case. Uh, next slide, please. And the final category of uh, worker, are those with no normal working hours. So this is uh, a category that is going to be uh, quite significantly affected by the Brazil judgment. It will include uh, bank staff on zero hours contracts where there is no commitment at any time to uh, any particular level of work include variable hours staff uh, and other casual workers. Um, and the approach required here is to calculate the workers average weekly pay over the last 52 worked weeks. And the reason we've underlined worked on the slide is that um, where if there are any weeks where the employee has not worked at all, you have to disregard those weeks for the purpose of the average calculation. Uh, and you can go back up to a maximum of 104 weeks to try to identify your 52 weeks worked if um, the employees worked less than 52 weeks over a total of 104 weeks then you simply take the total amount of time they've worked similarly 
if your employee um, is going to be working over a complete year, uh, but at the time of the calculation has not yet worked for a full 52 weeks, you simply take the total amount of time they worked, you still disregard any non-worked weeks, uh, and you accumulate all of the worked weeks and work out the average pay over whatever the, the period of work is at the time they take the annual leave, because that's the point at which you'd need to make the calculation. Uh, and then you, you uh, multiply the average weeks pay that you've determined by 5.6 weeks to get uh, their holiday entitlement. So those are the uh, four uh, categories of worker as per the ERA. If we go to the next slide, please. We're just going to run through some of the questions that uh, we've been asked since the uh, Brazil judgment came out, um, looking at the, the impact of the judgment. And the first one was, can we prorate statutory holiday entitlement for part-time staff? Now it says no on the slide. It's, it's a no but, because to a certain extent, uh, prorating of pay is baked into uh, the way that many part-time staff work. So you cannot prorate the entitlement to 5.6 calendar weeks paid annual leave. But as it says in the slide, part-time staff will need to take fewer days off in order to be away from work for 5.6 weeks. So um, someone who works five days a week, 5.6 weeks to them represents a total of 28 days paid leave in the year. Uh, but someone who works three days a week, 5.6 uh, calendar weeks paid annual leave to them represents 16.8 days of annual leave. So um, the the prorating, as I say, is to a certain extent um, built into the working pattern anyway, because they need to take less less time off to take 5.6 weeks. Um, and also, when looking at what is being paid for the time off, the week's pay calculation will, of course, be paid on their part-time salary. So someone's working three days a week in comparison to a five-day a week full-time worker will earn three-fifths three of a full-time equivalent. Uh, and so their normal week's pay will reflect that pro already prorated entitlement. So you can't prorate their 5.6 weeks paid annual leave, but you pay at the rate to reflect their working pattern. Um, next slide, please. Um, must we also pay unreduced contractual holiday pay? Again, the slide says no, and again, I would say no, but. <laughs> um, it's uh, correct that the uh, judgment affects statutory holiday pay only, and if you pay enhanced contractual holiday in excess of the statutory 5.6 weeks, you are entitled to reduce the contractual element on a pro rata basis in proportion to the working pattern if you wish. So to go back to uh, Ms. Brazel's um, 34 worked weeks in the year, if she was on an enhanced contractual um, uh, pay uh, and her employer had wanted to reduce that annual uh, pay to reflect the 73% roughly of a normal full-time uh, equivalent, it could do so and pay four weeks um, contractual uh, paid leave. Um, the but comes in, the caveat is, of course, you need to make sure that um, if you're doing that, you are still paying um, the, the relevant employees at the minimum statutory holiday entitlement. So it's worth doing the statutory holiday pay calculation for those employees to make sure that by prorating contractual holiday, you're not dipping below the minimum statutory holiday entitlement that is required in the Brazil calculation. Uh, next slide, please. Are permanently retained staff who work for multiple employers entitled to 5.6 weeks holiday pay per, per employer? So we've had, uh, it, it's quite common for casual workers to work for more than one employer at a time. And we have had um, some questions saying, surely we don't have to pay the full 5.6 weeks because that means this, this individual is getting 5.6 weeks from us and from their other two employers, that doesn't seem right. Well, yes, you do have to pay the full 5.6 weeks, but as it says on the slide, uh, the week's pay calculation will have taken into account their part-time salary. So an individual, individual who has one contract for three days a week and one contract for two days a week, their holiday entitlement 
would be uh, a week's pay based on two days a week times 5.6 and another based on three days a week times 5.6 and they'd be receiving no more than someone who works a five day week for an employer on a full time basis. So there isn't a windfall in that sense for the employee because they're getting that built in pro rata based on their working pay and time. Uh, next slide, please. So this is the, the, the final point um, really to cover before uh, handing over to Al to talk about the other um, employment law updates we're, we're going to cover this morning. Um, working out the impact of the judgment and the implications for uh, casual staff. Sorry, I realize this is the penultimate slide. <laughs> I've, got, I've got one more after this. Um, so yes, there's a, there's, a, there's a thought process to go through with casual staff on variable hours contracts. You, you'll need to consider the nature of the contract, look at uh, their variable hours, consider whether they're on a series of fixed term contracts um, that run together uh, in a way that brings them into the category identified by, by Brazil as someone who works a full year, because that is a, an important qualification. Um, someone on a fixed term contract who does not work a full year and isn't on a series of fixed term contracts um, with an expectation of um, a, a, a break, um, but a, a return to a new contract afterwards, which might move them into the full year category. Um, but but someone on a, a simple short term fixed term contracts would not be affected by the result judgment. Um, consider whether you've got any overarching umbrella contracts again, and what the effect that has on whether they might be considered to be working for you for a full year uh, and then looking at how your holiday pay is currently paid so uh, what, what what periods are you defining um, are you paying people in lieu on termination of fixed term contracts for instance are you um, taking the approach of rolling up holiday pay so that employees are not actually taking paid time off and being aware of the risks that that involved uh, because the fundamental underlying purpose of the working time directive and the working time regulations is to give employees a break from work, uh, not simply to roll up holiday pay. Um, although, um, as many of you will know, the, the slightly odd way the working time regulations are implemented means there's no specific sanction at the moment for rolling up holiday pay, even though it technically might not be lawful. Slightly odd position to be in, but you'll have to consider those implications when looking at your casual staff variable hours contracts. And finally, moving on to the next slide for me, please. Um, what are your strategic considerations in, in terms of next steps? So first of all, you'll need to be looking at your contracts and considering whether they're compliant. Obviously for new starters, you might want to be thinking about amendments to the contracts for, the, for, for those to make sure that they are, your calculations are in line um, with the requirements of the Brazil judgment. Um, for existing staff, if you need to make changes, um, we wouldn't normally expect that to require a full new contract to be issued. We would have thought that in most cases that can be achieved by uh, a letter of variation that's countersigned by the employee. Um, you'll need to check your current methodology of working for each of the categories of workers. Are you using um, the percentage calculation? Are you using the 12.07% calculation or are you using some kind of enhanced one that might actually, when applied to all of your workers, um, still meet the minimum uh, calculation criteria? Um, are you using a pro rata, a pro -rata principle uh, for part year workers that no longer works? Um, then you'll look at revising your contractual terms to, to meet the calculation requirements. You will have to think about working patterns of irregular workers in particular, uh, and um, look at whether, um, look at the necessary calculations for people who have gaps and don't have working weeks and, and going back and making the calculations for them. You will have to think about what your approach is going to be in respect of arrears of pay and whether to proactively approach staff about making payments of back pay or wait for them to approach you and and uh, reacting to um, staff who raise the issue if they do. Um, and connected with that, you'll have to think about what communications you're going to undertake with staff about updating of contracts and back pay and going forward. And in some ways, just the, to, to end on a positive note, it is a useful 
position that there's no particular um there's no wrongdoing here on part of employees who've been paying pro rata or percentage calculations of holiday pay um that was the approach that was recommended by ACAS. It was the approach that was recommended by the BEIS. Um, all that has happened is that you might need to approach employees to deal with uh, a change in the calculation method to reflect a recent change in the law. So it's a relatively straightforward position to be coming from to have those conversations if you do want to initiate them. Um, so that is a very, I, I appreciate that's a, a relatively high level uh, gallop through um, the, the implications of Brazil judgment. If you do have any questions, do please pop, pop it in the uh, Q and A, and we'll we'll have a look at it at the end of the uh, session. Uh, and I will now hand over to Al to cover the rest of the updates. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for that, Bob. Um, I definitely think I got the um, the better um, subject area to um, to go through um, first thing on a. Uh, Tuesday morning. Um, so thanks for that, Bob. Um, I'm going to um, look at some legislation reform and um, I'm also going to have a look at some fairly recent um, cases on some topical areas um, which um, are, are quite interesting. Um, I suppose what I would say in terms of the employment law legislation, obviously we're all familiar with the fact that we've got a new prime minister, uh, an entirely new cabinet, um, which means that we're not quite sure what the direction of travel is likely to look like um, at the moment in terms of employment law um, reform. I have, I have seen some bits and pieces, some coverage, which would suggest that perhaps some, kind, some employment law protections may well be um, walked back, but um, at this stage we haven't got any any meaningful um, detail on what that might look like. And to be honest, I think our prime minister and her chancellor have probably got some more pressing issues that they want to to deal with, and are not entirely focused on employment law legislation. Um, that being said, let's move to the next slide, please. So one of the things that um, the government, the previous government, um, were interested in was uh, looking at flexible working. And obviously um, the whole issue of flexible working was brought into sharper focus um, during COVID and, and the fact that it became quite clear that people could work flexibly, it does work. Um, and, um, it's it's not become the default position, um, but it's it's much more widely accepted. So you can probably see from um, Bob's background um, that he is working from home today with his guitars on the wall, and and that works well. But in terms of what the um, what the legal position is, um, the government issued a consultation back in 2021, and that was published. Um, it didn't propose an automatic right to work flexibly, but it did um, It did look at making uh, the scope of it broader and looking at making it a day one right rather than having to work for a prescribed number of weeks um, before having the ability to make a flexible working request. Um, the consultation looked at changing the business reasons for being able to refuse a request. Um, it would require employer to suggest alternatives if that flexible working request included a working pattern, for example, that it couldn't uh, agree to for obviously business reasons, but it would require an employer to come up with something else that may work. It's looking at changing the administrative process of how a um, flexible working uh, uh, request is made and being more proactive, <clears throat> excuse me, with the workforce about raising the awareness of the right to make a flexible working request and flexible working uh, more generally. So it will be interesting to see um, when and if that um, comes into any kind of um, re regulation as this parliamentary um, period progresses. Um, if we could move on to the next slide. Thank you, Jess. So um, another consultation that was launched back in 2019 um, was how to better tackle sexual harassment in the workplace. 
um, following a report that was published by the Women's and Equality Select Committee. And then in uh, July 21, the government pu published its response to the 2019 consultation on workplace uh, sexual harassment. So the headline proposals in relation to that consultation document, Jess, if you wouldn't mind moving on. Thank you. Um, it, uh, the headline proposals are, were to proactively, um, a proactive duty on employers to prevent sexual harassment. Um, there would be a right uh, for further enforcement action by the, or further power, should I say, for, for further enforcement action by the EHRC. Um, there would be a change in terms of ensuring that legal protections are in place to protect uh, employees from third party harassment. Uh, there would be an extension to the time limit for bringing claims um, and it would apply to volunteers and interns. Uh, just on the extending the time limit to bring claims, just as a reminder, the law as it currently stands is that it requires an individual to bring a claim within three months of the al alleged act of harassment. Often this can be problematic if there are um, a number or, or a series of acts of harassment over a period of time. Um, and it can be quite difficult sometimes for claimants to um, bring the claims in time or to argue that there's been a, um, um, a continued act over a period of time. So I think um, that extending this time limit was brought about or introduced to, to deal with that point. Um, if we could um, move on. Something a bit more um, recent and um, was um, announced by the government in 2022. And some of this came about because there was concern within government that employers were, um, what's the word, uh, employing shoddy practices in terms of firing and, and rehiring. And I suppose this was brought into very sharp focus with what happened with P&O. Um, and for those of you who can cast your minds back to what happened in March uh, or earlier this year is that P&O um, dismissed its entire workforce and then engaged, um, um, I think it was agency staff in the end, on much more inferior terms conditions. And their justification for doing that was that they were at a, a point where if they didn't do something drastic and different, it would actually um, have an impact on the viability of that cross-channel ferry operation. And obviously, their argument, well, part of their argument was that that was an essential part of English um, infrastructure in terms of importing and exporting goods out of and into the UK. Um, now, what ultimately happened is uh, as we all know, is that P&O essentially paid off um, the employment claims um, brought um, that were potentially there for those employees. So it never really got litigated. But you'll probably remember Boris Johnson standing up in Parliament and, and making all sorts of um, uh, oh, it's intending intentions. Is that right word? Um, that uh, you know P&O would be sued for breaching all sorts of employment rights and um uh, their duties to inform and consult employees and so on and so forth as it turned out couldn't do any of those because the ships were actually registered overseas anyway but that's a bit of a, a, a waffly introduction into this but as a result of that the government announced that it would issue a statutory code of practice on the fire and rehire practices that tribunals and courts would be required to take into account when considering relevant cases. Um, specifically, they, the courts tribunals will have a power to apply an uplift of up to 25% of an employee's compensation where the code apply, applies and the employer unreasonably fails to follow it. Um, the draft code of practice will be published when parliamentary time um, allows. So um, again, given what we're going through at the moment, um, I'm, it's not entirely clear um, when that might be, um, but I think it's a, a question of watch this space. Um, 
Bob and I um, attended a, um, a webinar with the Top Employment Silk uh, last week, and his view was very much that fire and rehire is very, very unpopular, and the direction of travel is that uh, tribunals and courts will be looking very, very carefully at the business reasons behind any proposal to fire and rehire. Um, and that I think he described it as you need to have a flaming platform uh, uh, when you are proposing on uh, doing that. I I'm not sure whether I entirely agree with that. Um, there is always going to be, I mean, I've certainly advised them in the past, I know that Bob probably has as well, where you have a good cogent business reason, you've considered it very carefully and fire and rehire is the most appropriate thing to do where you can't get agreement on variations of terms and conditions. So I think probably uh, one to watch um, and we'll see where it goes. Um, Jess, could you move on to the next slide, please? So I'm now gonna um, look at some recent case law and some of the cases that we've picked are things that we think are interesting and um, relevant in light of, um, of what has happened. And obviously, um, an employment law update wouldn't be an employment law update without a case on COVID. Um, and so um, this is where I'm going to start. And this is a case of Burke and Turning Point Scotland. Um, and this, this case basically looks at the issue of long COVID uh, and the extent to which it can or can't be considered to be a disability. Um, and long COVID appears to manifest itself in a number of different ways. Uh, and I think as a as medical practitioners and sort of as lawyers as well, it's going to probably take some time to fully understand. Um, and it can be difficult for employers to navigate. Um, and we are now beginning to see the first of uh, first cases that deal with long COVID. So in this case, Mr. Burke was employed as a caretaker. He tested positive for COVID in November 2020 and he began to deteriorate towards the end of his isolation period and was unable to return to work. His symptoms were described as unpredictable, including joint pain, loss of appetite, reduced ability to concentrate, fatigue and exhaustion. Uh, although Mr. Burke continued to provide fit notes from his GP, um, his um, turning point, his employer began to question the validity of his symptoms. They weren't quite sure what all these symptoms were and how they how they matched up. Two occupational health reports were requested by the employer and they stated that he was fit to return and was unlikely to be disabled under the Equality Act. However, due to his ongoing symptoms, Mr. Burke was unable to return to work and he was then dismissed for capability in August 2021. So Mr. Um, Mr. Mr. Burke brought a claim for unfair dismissal and he also brought a claim for disability um, discrimination. And the tribunal concluded that notwithstanding what the occupational health report said about his condition, he was disabled during the relevant period. They said that he had a physical impairment, which in this case they described as post viral fatigue syndrome caused by COVID 19 which had an adverse effect on his ability to carry out normal day-to-day -day activities, which is one of the tests to show that an individual is disabled. The adverse effect in this case, they said, was more minor than trivial and it was long-term. So again, satisfying the test of a disability. Mr. Burke had no incentive to remain off work having exhausted his sick pay. Uh, and the tribunal considered that he was not exaggerating his symptoms. So I think what this case does is it, it helpfully illustrates that when COVID-19 symptoms um, can well qualify for a disability, even though they vary um, and will not automatically, um, because of that variation, will not automatically mean that he is not classed as disabled. So I think it's really important, again, when you're looking at how you ask questions to your occupational health provider, that you consider this is difficult because in this case, the occupational health provider said categorically that the individual wasn't disabled. So I think it's just something to have in mind um, if you're having to deal with um, these sorts of 
um, cases. Um, if we can move on to the next slide. So this is another um, discrimination case, and this time it is an age discrimination case uh, in the case where somebody was selected for redundancy. So in this case, um, Mr. Uh, Kirk was employed by Citibank and he was employed as a corporate banker. Um, he had worked there from 2011 until 2017 when he was dismissed, uh, well, uh, when he was dismissed. He was head of energy in their energy power and metals and mining franchises. His comparator for the purposes of his age discrimination was a lady called Miss Olive, uh, and she was the head, to, head of metals and mining. In 2017, it was decided that these franchises would be uh, led by a single managing director uh, and that Miss Olive would take up the role, meaning that Mr. Kirk, who was aged 55 at the time, and um, uh, would be, uh, sorry, was selected for redundancy. Ms. Olive, um, the lady who was appointed in that role, was 51. Mr. Kirk, so a relatively small age difference, um, which is relevant. Uh, Mr. Kirk appealed the decision and his decision was dismissed. He then went on to bring a number of claims, including one for um, age discrimination. So he said that there were um, a number of comments that were made to him um, whilst he was employed, um, things like he was a bit old and set in his ways. Um, and that caused him to think that actually this decision had been made because of his age. So just going back to what the law actually says around age discrimination, it says that a person discriminates against another if they treat them less favorably than others because of a protected characteristic. And in this case, this was age discrimination. Uh, a protective uh, characteristic, sorry, was his age. The individual claiming discrimination needs to show that they've been treated less favorably than a real or hypothetical comparator whose circumstances are not materially difficult to his. So his comparator in this case is Ms. Olive. Um, there's a two-stage test uh, in discrimination cases uh, and the Employment Tribunal applied the two-stage test from the case of Eigen and Wong, which requires that one, the complainant to is required to prove facts to enable the tribunal to conclude that the unlawful act of discrimination has been committed and two, that if the first stage is proven, the respondent is, to re is required to prove that they did not commit the unlawful act if the complaint is not upheld. So Mr. Kirk alleged that he had been told by Mr. Velker, his line manager, as I said earlier, that he was old and set in his way. So on the balance of probabilities, Mr. Falker had, uh, it was found by the employment tribunal that that comment had been made. As to the second stage, it found that Citibank fell a long way short of convincing the ET that the treatment was not on the prohibited grounds of age. Um, that, that means they just didn't like their evidence, they didn't find it credible, and Mr. Kurt's claim was therefore upheld. Citibank appealed uh, on a number of grounds, one of which related to the alleged failure by the Employment Tribunal to properly apply the second stage of the Eigen test. Uh, the, employment, the EAT found that the ET had failed to sufficiently delve into the evidence relating to Citibank's belief that Mr. Kirk and Ms. Olive were in the same age bracket. The EAT held that the finding of fact relating to Mr. Falker's remark did not absolve the ET from considering Citibank's explanation for the dismissal and that it was incumbent on the ET to consider evidence from Citibank as part of its case 